All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. We appreciate your attendance tonight. We will begin this evening's meeting with our budget hearing, and that will be a budget presentation uh, by Mr. Darren Rice, our CFO. At the conclusion of his presentation, there will be a, an opportunity for public comment regarding um, the budget hearing specifically. If you signed up for public comment during the regular meeting, that'll be at a separate time. But this, um, there will be an opportunity following his presentation for uh, public comment. So this time we'll turn it over to Mr. Rice for his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Noll. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll, and community members. It is my pleasure to present the 2019-2020 uh, annual budget. First, I would like to recognize the finance team that is here this evening, uh, Ms. Janice Stowers and Ms. Karen Garza. They have been very instrumental in the preparation of this budget, so thank you very much for your work. I'd like to start each of my presentations with the financial highlights of the current year. And uh, this year we just uh, received our preliminary financial integrity ready rating system of Texas report. Uh, we received a superior rating, which is the highest rating you, you can receive. And we actually received a hundred on this. We had no uh, dismissals on that. Um, we also get recognized from the state comptroller's office uh, for our transparency presentations. We receive transparency awards for traditional finances debt obligations, and contract and procurement presentations. Each of those presentations can be found on the district's transparency website. Uh, Texas Smart Schools, formerly known as the FAST Report, is a program that was started in the state comptroller's office. It highlights success in two dimensions, both academic performance and cost-effective finances. Conroe ISD is one, of, is, is one of two districts that out of over 1,100 that have received five stars, which is the highest rating for 10 consecutive years. Our ERG ranking, ERG stands for Education Resources Group, and they perform an analysis of the 200 largest districts, and ranking is done also on academic and financial performance. Conroe ISD is currently ranked second in the state. Each year, we like to do a comparison uh, with ourselves to state averages by function, and we spend $7,965 per student which is $916 per student less than the state spends. If we spent at the state average rate of $8,881 per student, our budget would have to increase by an additional $57.6 million. We run a very efficient school district. 63.75% of our budget is spent on instruction compared to 57.69% for the state. We put our funding into the classroom. If we spent at the state average rate for instruction, that would mean $30 million less for instruction. And we continue to spend approximately one third the state average in central administration. We spend 1.79% of our budget in central administration compared to the state at 4.86%. And we, can, we continue to spend well in security and monitoring services at 1.46 compared to 1.17 at the state level. Just a quick uh, legislative update. I know we've seen this uh, several times. Um, at the start of the 86th legislative session, the governor had basically three goals as it pertains to school finance. One was to provide property tax relief, uh, two, to put more money into the classroom, and three, to try to simplify the complicated school funding formula. Uh, House, Bill was, House Bill 3 was named the Texas Plan, and this chart outlines the major uh, initiatives of the governor. So now just some uh, House Bill 3 highlights. It increases the basic allotment from with 5140 to 6160 per student. And this uh, is the basic mechanism that the state used to provide teacher raises and property tax relief. It also requires districts to provide full day pre-K to eligible four-year-old students. The cost of this program alone, alone, not including the additional classroom space needed is $5 million. And we need about 50 additional classrooms to handle full day pre-K. Uh, it moves the use of current property values for determining our state funding, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And it provides uniform tax relief for the biennium of seven cents compression on the tier one m <clears throat> tax rate. As you will see, our tax rate is uh, looking to decrease from $1.4 to 97 cents. And it prohibits school districts from in increasing the m and tax rate to create a surplus to buy down the debt. We have traditionally had a practice of using surplus uh, uh, M&O tax rate revenues to buy down our debt service tax rate. It's about two and a half cents, and you'll see how that has affected our tax rate moving forward. Um, 
you know, basically with the measures of House Bill 3, the state has essentially set our tax rate for us. You can also see the new allotments that House Bill 3 provided, and then you can see that there's also some allotments that they repealed. <clears throat> this is our general fund balance, and this chart represents the fund balance of the general fund over the past 11 years. Our, in 2008, our fund balance was $76 million, and it's projecting it at the end of 2019 to be at $139.6 million. If you notice in the far right uh, column, that's our 2019 projected fund balance. If you see the green shading, that green shading is the $15 million that the uh, board has identified to be used out of the fund balance for technology purchases to support the November 2019 bond referendum. So we will start with taking a look at the major components that drive the budget, and they begin with our 2019-2020 budget objectives. And they include to meet the needs for the 2019-2020 school year. Uh, we just opened Suchma Elementary and 11th grade at Grand Oaks High School. And we want to provide a competitive compensation plan. And we place high priority on safety and security at our campuses. This year, we hired additional prevention control officers at our high schools. And we want to protect the district's operational infrastructure by establishing a district-wide maintenance fund. Our attendance data. Our state revenue estimates and campus expenditure budget allocations rely on our enrollment data. For the upcoming 2019-2020 budget, we're using an enrollment increase of 1,350 <clears throat> students for a total enrollment of 64,187 students. And we're using 94.3% to calculate our average daily attendance. It is important to note that the expenditure budget is based on enrollment and state funding is provided based on our average daily attendance. Our certified property values, our property values increased by 6.56%. Uh, and this growth will add about 2.34 billion to our property values, bringing our total value to $38.1 billion. However, with House Bill 3, Moving to the use of current year property values for calculation of state funding, we will realize no new revenue in the general fund based on this increased certified value. And I will demonstrate this over the next few slides. We have heard statements that somehow CISD is the driver of increased property values, not only in our district, but for the whole county. I will show that the state of Texas through the state comptroller's office, is the one mandating those valuations. And the state, not the local ISDs, is the one benefiting from those results. This is a statement from our comptroller himself, uh, Glenn Hager. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read it. The rapid rise in Texas property values has forced local tax collections sharply upward, putting a financial strain on many homeowners and bringing the calls for tax relief. It's important, and this is very important. However, to realize that these problems are built into the funding formulas of the current system. Let me repeat that. These problems are built into the funding formulas of the current system. Right now, due to those formulas, rising property tax collections are actually reducing the state share of the total bill. Let me repeat that one. Actually reducing the state share of the total bill. And it's forcing schools to rely increasingly on their own taxes, despite widespread taxpayer dissatisfaction. I can't be any clearer than that. So now we're just going to see the math of how that works. We have three different estimates <clears throat> of AV growth, a one at five and a half percent, our certified values that came in at 6.56 percent, and another estimate at eight percent. And what I'll show you here is that although we generate additional tax revenue, the state dollar for dollar, dollar for dollar, takes that funding away from us. So our available funding on the maintenance and operation side of our budget does not increase. So let's look at a five and a half percent AD growth. Our tax revenue increase is 2.24 million. State revenue with 1,350 new students and the effects of House Bill 3 generates $45.11 million. Total estimated available funding, $47.35 million. 
So let's move to a certified. This is our certified values came in at 6.56% AV growth. Our tax revenue increase, $5.9 million. That's $3.66 million additional in tax revenues. However, what the state does and what they don't want y'all to know is that even though we had 1,350 new students come in, the effects of House Bill 3, they take that money right away from us. Dollar for dollar, $41.45 million. Total estimated available funding, $47.35 million. So you get the story I'm sitting here telling you. Let's say our property values came in at 8%, large increase. Tax revenue increase, $11.2 million. State revenue decreases by that same $8.96 million that it just increased. Total estimated available funding, $47.35 million. Can't be any clearer than that, it's black and white. So now let's look at our 2019-2020 proposed tax rate. I'm gonna take y'all back to 2017-2018, looking at our adopted rate. We had an, an adopted maintenance and operations tax rate of $1.04. Debt service was 24 cents for a total tax rate of $1.28. Everybody remembers Hurricane Harvey. We had the ability to access golden pennies from the state. To access those, we had to increase our maintenance and operations tax rate by two cents. But we didn't want that to affect the taxpayers. So we decreased our debt service tax rate by that same amount. <clears throat> we knew that was a one year thing that we would have to revert back to the previous year's tax rate. It was one year. So you can see our 2018-19 adopted tax <clears throat> rate, the two cent increase for maintenance and operation, $1.06, debt service to 22 cents, the decrease, total tax rate $1.28, no effect to the taxpayers. So for 2019-2020, our beginning point is now the reverted rate, which is $1.04 for maintenance and operation, and 24 cents for debt service. Total tax rate, $1.28. Now let's look at the, the impact of House Bill 3. Our maintenance and, and operations tax rate is being compressed by the state by seven cents. So we're moving from $1.04 to 97 cents. But now let's look at the effect of House Bill 3 has on the debt service fund. House Bill 3 prohibits school districts from an increasing the MO tax rate to create a surplus to pay down the debt. And we have verified with our bond council that the annual transfer that we currently do from the general fund to debt service to buy down the debt service tax rate falls under the purviews of this law. So as you can see, that is about $10 million. And we talked about that just a little bit earlier. That's $10 million that we're no longer able to transfer to debt service tax rate. So we have to increase that debt service tax rate by two and a half cents to make up that loss of $10 million. So that has a proposed debt service tax rate of 26 and a half cents. So our total tax rate proposed for 2019, 2020 is 97 cents for maintenance and operations, 26 and a half cents for debt service, for a total tax rate of $1.23 and a half. That's a four and a half cent tax decrease for our taxpayers. And I would like to point out that this debt service tax rate is required to service the debt that we currently have. You know, we've had past bond referendums and this is the debt service uh, that is required to pay for those bonds. This does not include any new bond amount. You know, unfortunately, House Bill 3 change the rules for us. This is truth in taxation calculation uh, certified by Tammy McRae. Um, this is access to anybody, anybody can look at this. Very simple calculation. How much debt do we have to pay off next year divided by your appraised values and that gives you the tax rate that you have to uh, fund your debt service payment with. 26 and a half cents certified by Ms. Tammy McRae. And I would like to point out that this is a voter approved tax rate. 2008 bond referendum, 2015 bond referendum, both of those had over 10 cents worth of proposed tax rate increase on the debt service side, but we have only realized a net increase of one cent since on the debt service side since 2008, only one cent. So this is a voter approved tax rate. <clears throat> This is our proposed 2019-2020 uh, tax rate compared with the greater Houston area. Conroe ISD is in the yellow. We're the second lowest tax rate in the greater Houston area. 
That includes all the Montgomery County school districts, all the greater Houston area school districts. And if you look at the districts in the green, those are the districts that we compare to both academically and financially. Um, New Caney ISD on the far left remains the highest tax rate at $1.5684. That is 33.34 cents higher than CISD's tax rate. <clears throat> now just shrink that comparison down a little bit. This is just a comparison with our peer districts, Katy, Spring, Umble, Cypher, Klein, Fort Bend. We're 14.7 cents below the average of those districts. And we're three and a half cents below the closest district to us in the tax rate, which is Fort Bend. Now let's look at our tax rate history. This is uh, the past five years. You can see our, our, our tax rate uh, was $1.28 for the past uh, five years, and we've compared favorably. The, the red line above is our average peer tax rate. You can see we've, we've been above that for years. Our 2019-2020 proposed tax rate of $1.23 and a half is four and a half cents lower than it was last year. So now that we've discussed the major components that drive the budget, we will now look at the effect that they have on the budget itself. Now I left the estimated 5.5% AV growth just to show the effects that the state is the one benefiting, just, just to remind y'all, but we're gonna concentrate on the certified column of 6.65% AV growth. On the tax revenue side, a tax revenue decrease by House Bill 3 with 6.56% AV growth is a decrease of tax revenue by $4.1 million. The tax revenue increase that we're needing to realize is this is the $10 million that we used to send to the debt service fund that we're no longer able to uh, from tax revenues. So our total tax revenue increase is $5.9 million. Our state revenue, based off of 1,350 student growth and the effects of House Bill 3, you can see it decreases from 45.11 million to 41.45 million. Our investment income, we're able to increase our investment income by $1 million. TRS in-kind funds, $5 million. That's just a state required accounting entry that we must do and we must record those uh, in-kind funds. And you'll see an offset on the expenditure side also. So total estimated available funding, it doesn't matter if it's 5.5% AV growth, 6.56 AV growth, or 8% or 10% or 20%, $53.35 million. So now we'll look at the expenditure side of the budget. This is our 2019-2020 uh, salary increase. It includes a 3.5% raise for our teachers, librarians, nurses, and counselors. There's also a $500 adjustment for every teacher with six plus years experience. That's at a cost of $9.6 million. Pay grades AE, levels one through three, will receive a 3.5% raise. Levels four through 10, a 3% raise. That is a cost of $1.75 million. Administrative business, a 3% raise at a cost of $266,000. Our administrative support, instructional support, auxiliary, and police will all receive a 3.5% raise. That's all our hourly employees. Uh, total cost of the raise, $14.05 million. This is our approved 2019-2020 teacher hiring schedule, and it, and it has a new hiring uh, schedule for our new teachers, $55,500. Personnel for growth for support at the campus level for 1,350 new students and the opening of Suchman Elementary and 11th grade at Grand Oaks High School. It includes 153 new positions that are made up of 107 <coughs> teachers, 10 administrators, nine professionals, and 27 paraprofessionals. And that's at a cost of roughly $9 million. And then to support our campuses, we're adding 56.4 new positions, mainly in our transportation, police, and maintenance and custodial departments. And that is a cost of about uh, $2 million. So total position increase of 209.4, uh, total payroll addition, 10.98 million. So this is the projected expenditure budget increase for 2019-2020. Uh, this is a summary of what we just talked about. Additional personnel for growth, $10.98 million. Our salary increase, $14.05 million. 
A potential employee retention siphon, we've talked about this, $5 million is out there depending on how the budget looks uh, later on in the year. That's about $625 per employee in the district. Um, programs that sit in the all-inclusive list, but the increases from House Bill 3, it includes pre-K, CTE, bilingual dyslexia, comp ed, safety and security, et cetera, 7.29 million. Other expenses in our budget that must increase utilities, <clears throat> insurance, fuel, and supplies, that's $1.81 million. The offset to our, uh, our revenue on TRS and kind funds, $5 million. And then we have the transfer to the capital maintenance fund of $10 million. This is the $10 million that we used to transfer into debt service fund. The board has elected to fund the capital maintenance fund um, equivalent for five years of $50 million uh, with this transfer. And what this transfer does is allow us to move $50 million out of, a, out of the bond requirement, put it into this maintenance fund and pay for these maintenance items out of cash. And with us doing that, that has a cost avoidance of interest cost of over $40 million. So I applaud the board for, board for this move. So total expenditures, $54.13 million. So this is our 2019-2020 projected budget. Our beginning revenue budget, $502.27 million. We have $53.35 million worth of new revenues, giving us a projected 1920 revenue budget of $555.62 million. On the expenditure side of the budget, our beginning expenditure budget, $495.45 million. We have $54.13 million worth of uh, new expenditures, giving us a projected 1920 expenditure budget of $549.58 million. And that leaves us with a budget surplus, an estimated budget surplus of about $6.04 million. So we do have a proposal for that budget surplus. We have to remember that the state budgets in a two-year biennium. What we're looking at is the first year of this biennium. So we need to save the surplus in the general fund budget to support the 2021 budget. That year we will be opening a new junior high and the costs associated with that. And in a minute you'll see on my pro forma for 2021, we're actually showing a, a potential deficit in that year that this will help us offset. And then if any funds are remaining, we wanna utilize that surplus to support our capital maintenance fund, reduce bond debt requirements, and cover any other unforeseen expenditures. So this pie chart shows the bu budget broken down by major object, and that includes payroll. We're very people intensive. 87.6% of our budget is, is payroll. 5% of our budget is contracted services. <coughs> the largest item in that is our utility bill. Supplies and materials make up 4.2% of our budget. The largest item in there is fuel for our buses. Equipment and other is 1.4% of our budget. The largest item in there is insurance for our properties. And then you can see the creation of our capital maintenance fund is 1.8% of our budget. So our 2019-2020 proposed budget is $549,580,294. Just showing this, this is the form that we'll be asking the board to adopt the budget in later on this evening. So now just a quick analysis of our fund balance. Uh, we have an objective to maintain an unassigned ba uh, fund balance to stay within the range of 20 to 25% of our annual budget, which gives us about three months worth of expenses. Our 2019-2020 preliminary budget is $549.6 million. Our estimated unassigned fund balance at 831.19 is $134.1 million, which is right about 24.4% of our budget. This is $3.2 million under the high end range of 25%, but it's $24.2 million over our 20% target. And if y'all remember, we talked about that $15 million that the board identified for technology purchases. They have taken that out of this $24 million that we're showing there. So this is just a quick pro forma of our 2021 budget. It includes estimated total revenue of $565.02 million. Estimated total expenditures of $571.58 million, leaving us with a potential deficit of $6.56 million. That is all, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rice. At this time, we'll have an opportunity for public comment. Uh, if you would keep your comments from three to five minutes. Uh, if you would like to make a comment, you please come to the podium here in the middle uh, and state your name, and then we would uh, be happy to hear your comment. Uh, 
All right. No, oh, and we have one. Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Eric Yalik. I live in the Woodlands, right across the street from the Woodlands ninth grade campus. I just sat through and listened to Mr. Rice's entire presentation, and there were three words that really jumped out at me that were missing from the presentation. Effective tax rate. That's the tax rate that if you go above it, you're actually raising taxes because you are adopting a rate that multiplied by the increase in average appraisals yields more taxes for the average family. Now, there's been a lot of comments in the last week and a half about motives of people and you know why people are talking about the bond and your tax rate and your budget the way that they are. And one thing that's really jumped out at me is the allegation that people are doing it for selfish reasons. But the reality is, is that most of the people who are talking about the concerns about your tax rate and your budget are people who can pay the taxes, who have no trouble whatsoever. You know, y'all have heard that I, I've already said I'm going to put $150,000 into the anti-bond campaign. And obviously, someone like that doesn't need to worry about paying my property taxes. That's not the issue. So I went for a walk today. I parked my car, and I walked six blocks around Booker T. Washington Junior High School. And there were a lot of people who were standing outside in the heat. I like being in the heat, so it was great talking to them. And I asked them just how are things going? What's it like living across the street from a junior high school? And without me prompting them, they didn't know who I was at all. I told them my name was Eric and that was it. There were two people who said to me, we're having trouble keeping up with our property taxes. Now, you know, it's one thing for someone who lives in the woodlands to have to worry about their property taxes. But someone who lives, and I, I went back to my office and I looked at what the appraisals were on the homes where we were standing and how much the school taxes were from Conroe ISD. For someone like that to be paying $448 a year in school taxes is a giant chunk of change for them. And the reason I mention it to you is, you know, it's, it's one thing to worry about, you know, do, where does someone live? Where does Kelly Cook live? She doesn't live in the district. Uh, where does Eric Yalik live? Well, he's down with the rich folk in the woodlands. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you all, very obviously, I'm not doing this for Eric Yalik. I can pay the taxes. The problem is, is that as a society, we are taxing parents literally out of their homes. Parents cannot spend the necessary time that they need to be able to nurture their children and work with maybe one parent only having to work outside the home as opposed to the other. And that is truly the difference between when I was in high school and I graduated from high school in 1979, I'm an old man, and today disposable income is the amount that the taxes take from disposable income is gigantic. It's 52% if you add in all types of taxes for all Americans. Back in 1979, it was 17%. That's the reason, or at least one of the drivers, behind the fact that families are breaking up. And so I hope that, I hope that you'll do a whole lot more than just go towards the effective tax rate, which happens to be 1.2344 per $100 valuation. I hope that you'll actually give some real relief, just like the Texas legislature and Representative Dan Huberty promised in House Bill 3, that people would get some compression, that seven cents that Mr. Rice talked about. If you adopt a budget above the effective tax rate, you're increasing the taxes of those people who live across the street from Booker T. Washington Junior High School. They're the ones who are suffering. I'm not suffering. 
And, and quite honestly, that's the reason that you see people like me, Kelly, quite frankly, Trustee Inman. Uh, that's why we're doing this. We're not doing it because we care that much about how much money is coming out of our own pockets. Please help them. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I'll go next if you're you need that check. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, my name is Joshua Jarris. I have two children, uh, two sons that attend uh, Burnham Woods Elementary. And uh, I want to echo a little bit of what uh, Eric said. Uh, we would like to see at least at the minimum the effective tax rate um, maintained. I would like to see a decrease in that. You know, I, I listen to all these numbers that, that were put up on the screen and the, the bottom line is taxpayers that, that have own houses and own property are going to be paying more money. You know, I spent a great deal up at the legislature uh, in Austin this last year and they talked a lot about giving property owners tax relief. That was about the main topic that was heard up at the Capitol this year. <clears throat> People are asking for relief because they're getting taxed out of their homes. And I find that this, this, this all, we keep seeing this, you know, you want to pass a new bond. You want to keep raising up the taxes. You're increasing it. You're not listening to the people that live that have to pay the bills. These people are struggling. And like Eric said, you know, for a lot of people, that doesn't, that doesn't affect you. You know, you can easily cop up a couple extra thousand bucks or a few hundred more. But people are striving and are really struggling right now. And that's why our legislator made it a prior, priority for this to take place. And you all are just washing it away. You're taking away anything that took place in the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lex? <clears throat> Go ahead. Anyone? <laughs> Carrie Freemeyer. I am a native Conroeite. I am a taxpayer here. And I'm also an educator here. And I just want to commend the uh, the. Uh, finance department for all that they've done and the transparency that they show and they've done, always done an excellent job on uh, presenting and getting us the clear picture of what's going on and yes there are some uh, property increases but comparable to other districts and compared to other regions in our area this is by far without a doubt, the best place to live. And um, I just wanted to commend, again, I'm gonna repeat that. I'm gonna commend the finance department for all the hard work that they did on this and showing um, everyone. And I really hope that more people are aware of what we're doing here in Conroe ISD. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> All right, thank you. That will conclude our budget hearing, Mr. President. I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show, let the record show that a quorum of its members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and the notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas, Texas Government Code 551. The time is 6.33. Uh, Mr. Kidd, if you will, item 1A and B. It's going to be our invocation and pleasure pleaded. Uh, if you would like to uh, join me in prayer, please uh, bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for your grace. Dear God, just uh, thank you for, for a good summer and a good start of the school year. And dear Lord, we lift up all of our students and we just pray for their continued protection. And we ask that you be with each and every student. Uh, teacher, educator, uh, nurse, officer, all of those within our district, Lord. We just pray that you be with them throughout this school year. Dear God, we also especially lift up those families who have suffered loss, uh, dear God, and we just ask that you uh, put your arms around them and comfort them, Lord. Dear Father, thank you for those in this room and their hearts for service in their hearts for your children. And dear God, we ask for your continued guidance and direction 
as we uh, do the business of the school district and we make decisions. And Lord, we also just pray uh, that in the way that we address the issues and the way that we debate and the way that we discuss, Lord, that it would be pleasing to you. Dear Lord, just uh, bless this time together tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 I mean, pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Texas Pledge. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Kipp. Item two, awards and recognition. Dr. No. Uh, citizens participation, I believe will go. Yeah. It's gonna be a part of that. Okay. Yeah. All right, citizen participation. Uh, Ms. Goffer, has anyone first to address the board? Yes, they have. The next 30 minutes has been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted has adopted complaint policies that are designated to secure at the lowest administrative level that prompt an equitable resolution to complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. Delegations of more than five must appoint a representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person signed up to address the board. Carrie Freemeyer. Because you were first. You signed up first. <laughs> signed up first. You first. Well, thank you. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Superintendent Dr. Nall. On behalf of the Texas State Teachers Association and the National Education Association, I am the newly uh, elected uh, TSTA CONRO president, Carrie Freemeyer. Right. The National Education Association. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, the National Ec Education Association's vision, mission, and value statement supports public education first and foremost. And I would like to reiterate these statements to you as their local representative. We, the members of the National Education Association of the United States, are the voice of education professionals. Our work is fundamental to the nation and we accept the profound trust placed in us. Our vision is a great public school for every student. Our vision is to advocate for education professionals and to unite our members and the nation to fulfill the promise of public education to prepare every student to succeed in a diverse and interdependent world. Our core values include the following principles which guide our work and define our mission. Equal opportunity. We believe public education is a gateway to opportunity. All students have the human and civil right to a quality public education that develops their potential, independence, and character. We also believe in our mission, a just society. We believe public education is vital to building respect for the work, dignity, and the equality of every individual in our diverse society. We also have in our mission, democracy. We believe public education in the is the cornerstone of our republic. Public education provides individuals with the skills to be involved, informed, and engaged in our representative democracy. Let me repeat that, democracy. Professionalism. We believe that the expertise and judgment of education professionals are critical to student success. We maintain the highest professional standards and we expect the status, compensation, and respect due all professionals. Partnership. We believe in partnerships with parents, families, communities, and other stakeholders that are essential to quality public education and student success. And we also have in our mission, collective action. We believe individuals are strengthened when they work together for the common good of the public. As education professionals, we improve both our professional status and the quality of public education when we unite and advocate collectively. There's no higher mission 
for us public school educators than those I've just reiterated. You can count on TSDA Conroe to uphold the vision, mission, and core values of the NEA and to work with Conroe ISD, you, to make them a reality for our students, our teachers, and all employees of our Conroe ISD. At this time, I would like to take a moment to introduce TSDA Conroe's Executive Board, Christy Swoboda, Vice President, Lori Baus, Secretary, and um, we also have Danny Morris, who is our ESP representative at large, and he is not here at this meeting, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Josh Garros. Good evening again. My name is Joshua Jarris. Uh, I mentioned before I have two children that attend uh, Burnham Woods Elementary. Um, I've addressed this board before on the subject of school lunch. I wanted to give you an update real quick, and uh, I wanted to speak a little bit more on it as well. Um, this year, uh, HB 3145 went into effect. Uh, Non-custodial parents uh, can now attend school lunches uh, without Conroe ISD preventing them from doing so. Um, this was a big issue for me. I was disappointed that this board prevented uh, those, those parents from, from uh, having lunch with their children. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about liberty. You know, <clears throat> probably our country is the greatest country in the world. We have so many liberties and freedoms uh, in our country, and it's protected. And uh, I sometimes carry around a little uh, U.S. Uh, pocket constitution with me, and in it, it lists some of the things that the government cannot infringe upon me. And that's, that's one of the things I love about our country more than anything else. It's our liberty. And what you all did as a board when you stopped parents uh, unilaterally and, and prevented them from having lunch with their children is you took away their liberty. You took away these parents' liberty. You took away the children's liberty to have a relationship with each other. You know, and after this meeting, I, um, I heard about a program that you all had that allowed mentors to come in because you realized that this was an important time. And so while you were preventing parents from having a relationship and mentoring their old children, you allowed strangers to come in and mentor children. And I, it was shocking to me the things that were taking place in Conroe ISD. And it didn't just shock me. As I went and I shared with the legislators in the, in the Texas House and in the Senate about what had taken place, it was shocking for them too. And so I don't know where, where, where you guys decided to make the decision that you did, but you didn't act as a representative for parents, for children. You didn't stand up for liberty. And it's apparent that our, that our school uh, system here in Conroe ISD has, has, has some issues with allowing parents to participate in their children's education. You all know that parent participation raises the grades of children. I'm disappointed that y'all didn't take a stand on this and that it took a law to make this right. Um, I wanna give you guys some more information because I think this is an important topic. I think the school needs to address this more. So I'm handing you a little handout. There's actually a woman, her name is Wendy Perry. She's uh, accredited um, and she's approved by the TEA. She deals with the situation that you all are dealing with when you have parents that come from divorce or separation. Um, look, she'll come and she'll give a seminar for y'all. Uh, it counts as continuing credits of education. Again, she's the only person in Texas that can do this. I think it's a subject that our school system needs to address. And so with that, I'll just hand that out to you real quickly. I wanna close with something really quick. Look, we've got, I got calls from all over Texas because this wasn't just the only school that was doing that. And some of the, some of the uh, st uh, short, uh, stories that were shared with me were pretty amazing. But there was one, and this wasn't in Conroe ISD, but there was one uh, daughter that uh, shared something with her father. And this girl was really young and stuff. She just entered uh, kindergarten. And this school was preventing that uh, father from having lunch. And it was her birthday and coming up that week. And he asked her, well, what do you want me to do? Uh, what would you like for your birthday? And this little girl said, Daddy, I just want you to come have lunch with me at school. You know, this stuff is, this, this stuff is powerful, these messages that I see. 
These kids that come from these broken families, they are the kids that are hurting the most in your school. And what you all did to them, you kicked them again. Michael Clifton. Good evening, members of the board, President, Dr. Noll. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to, to rise and speak on behalf of uh, Mr. Geralds, the issue that he brought up. Um, specific to the school lunch program, the definition of activities, and his involvement as a father relative to that particular issue. Uh, this board has been entrusted with some very uh, important responsibilities, one of which I believe first and foremost is the children within your ISD. And in that respect, on this isolated issue, this board collectively failed miserably. Let me repeat that. He failed miserably on that. It took both chambers of our legislature to unanimously vote on a bill brought forward to them unanimously. Not one single person bicamerally agreed with this board on your position that you took when we went through your level three process. I'd like you to let that sink in. For those of you that have children and or grandchildren perhaps in this ISD, or for that matter, in any of the other 253 counties in this state, be glad that there are parents like Josh out there with the veracity to take an issue that he believes in front of the state legislature. Now your children and or your grandchildren, God forbid, if their parents go through a divorce, that they can now go and have lunch with their parent at school and not have to worry about school administration arbitrarily saying, no, we don't think lunch is a school activity. You can't do that. Thank you for your time. Eric Yalik. Okay. Lisa Evans. Hello, I'm Lisa Evans with Texas Mutual Insurance Company, and with me I have Peppa Gates, the regional leader for our greater for the greater Houston area. And at Texas Mutual, we believe that career and technical education and workforce readiness is a critical part of our future, of, of not just this area, but our entire state. And so we're very proud tonight to partner with the Souls Agency and Greg Ship and the district to on to support the programs with career and technical education specific to the area of safety. And so this evening we have a check to present. We're providing $65,126 wow. that covers the safety materials for all of the classrooms involved in the district. So thank you for wow. allowing us. Mr. President, Dr. Knoll, honored board members, I can't tell you the last time that I have been so excited about an opportunity. Uh, what Texas Mutual has done for us is given us an opportunity to help fully equip our programs so that our students have a safe learning environment. More importantly, they gave us an opportunity to look at our programs with a, a fresh set of eyes to go in and really evaluate what we were doing with safety. I worked with Jim Caker and his staff on that. And I can tell you with a great degree of confidence that our students will be better prepared to be safe learners this year. And most importantly, as they transition on to college and support themselves while they're in college or go into the workforce, they'll understand fully what personal protective equipment is and how to appropriately use this. As a former career tech teacher, I got to tell you, this is a magnificent gift for our students. And we humbly thank you all for supporting our students in Conroe ISD. Lisa, but we are just uh, really pleased as a board that uh, 
that Texas Mutual has stepped up to show their commitment to a safer workforce in Texas. And by beginning with a school district that they don't make any revenue from, okay? Uh, and I just say that so that there's no misunderstanding here. Y'all are trying to attack the problem of a safer workforce by training the, the young people, okay? And that's the way to do it. And that shows a huge commitment because this is not the only district that you're doing this in, I might add. And so, but it is the first. And, and we are truly honored. And in honor of that honor, okay, we would like to present you with a pie award. And every pie award has to have a pie. <laughs> pie stands for Patrons Influencing Education. And y'all certainly, as a company, have stepped up to the plate and done that today. And so on behalf of Souls Insurance, on behalf of the board, on behalf of CISD, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that outstanding. Appreciate everything you guys are doing outstanding. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you once again. Outstanding job. Yeah. We're going to put that in the night drop. There you go. Up to eight o'clock. I'm not sure if that was the Wood Forest speaking in him or the banker or right. the yes. board member. All the above. Ms. Gabriel, we, we, we are. All right. Outstanding. Uh, consent agenda items. Gentlemen, I've had one request so uh, to remove item H on the consent agenda by Mr. Hubert. So, Sands item eight. Do I have a um, motion? So moved for the amended agenda of A through G. A second. So we have a motion for A through G on the consent agenda. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. All right. Item uh, 3H. Consider award of RFP, RFP um, number 1808-02D Supplemental Contract, Contracted Education Service and Professional Development Services. Yes. Uh, Rick Reeves. Mr. Huber. Yeah, thank you. I just thought it was appropriate for us to pull it out because the size of the of the bid was a little over seventy five thousand. So I thought maybe we could pull it out and just just touch on us a little bit about what those programs are briefly, and then tell us where they who who would be benefiting from those. Sorry, this is the supplement to our already award, uh, awarded contract supplemental contract of insurance. Mm -hmm. So this covers our curriculum and instruction and our special ed departments. Right, and we've already voted on this. This is just the. This is Correct. just pulling it out. Correct. Okay. I just want to make sure that that was clear. This was not a new, nope. so, anything new. This is something we had already Correct. approved. For your, thank you very much. Huh? That's all I had. Mr. All right, gentlemen, can I get a motion? I move that we adopt the uh, um, 3H as presented. Second. Motion second. Discussion. Just had discussion, so all approved. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, all right. Item four, curriculum and instruction. Yes, Dr. Noe. We will receive our elementary and secondary summer school report. Dr. Phillips and Mr. Colson will make that presentation. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Null. Greg Colson and I appreciate the opportunity to share information regarding our summer school programs that have recently wrapped up. Summer is certainly not a time of rest for our team. They've been very, very busy this summer, but at the same time, our students have had a great time learning. Our elementary program offered seven different programs this year. And I'll go into those um, in, just a, in, in detail just a bit. But first off, I need to acknowledge Dr. Shelley Winkler for her work in coordinating all of our programs. Dr. Winkler, thank you so much. 
And also um, our summer school uh, summer school program is bigger. Most people don't realize that, but our summer school is bigger than many of our surrounding school districts. Uh, it takes a great deal of coordination. Dr. Winkler worked closely with Dr. Upshaw, as well as just about every department in the district, finance, HR, transportation, child nutrition, special ed assessment, federal programs, everyone pulled together to serve our program. And of course, uh, we couldn't accomplish anything without our leaders of summer school. And I have several of them here tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were a leader at our summer school program, would you please stand with our principals? Thank you so much. Thank you. We also, um, one of our counselors is here tonight, so Ashley Wright is here as well. So we appreciate your, your service to summer school. But you can see uh, Ryan Stepp was at Creighton, Kelly Garvin was at Ford, Katie Moe Houston, Kara Sally at Oak Ridge, Dr. Carlton Todd was at Rice, Amy Owen was our uh, was at our extended school year service, Randy Carter was at Moorhead serving grades four through six, uh, Robbie Cantu was at Travis, and Allison Brown helped us out at Vogel. We really appreciate it. So our first program that we offered was the Passport to Learning, and we also had a tuition-based program. And this program serves children in kindergartens through sixth grade. The purpose is to enhance skills in the area of reading, writing, math, and science. It was a half-day program, and it started on June 5th and uh, wound up on June 27th. Um, in our Passport, the Title I program, we had 1,104 students attend. In the tuition based, we had 50 students, so it was a total of 1,154 students served in our Title I program. We also had a bilingual program that was offered to pre-K through second grade students. This is a program required by federal law to be offered for pre-K and kinder. However, uh, Conroe offers this program, extends it to first and second grade, so we're really excited about that. Uh, it ran from June 5th to June 27th and was a full day program. And in our bilingual program, we served 763 students. Our ESL program is a is a, a program that we offer for children who speak a language other than Spanish or English. Uh, again, it was the same time as the bilingual program, June 5th through June 27th, full day, and we had 247 students. Our reading and math camp is an intensive targeted reading and math intervention program, and this is targeted for fifth grade students who need, uh, who need to be provided an additional assessment opportunity to take the test for the third time, the math and or reading star. This was a half-day program, and we served 344 students. We had a KidQuest enrichment program. This was tuition-based. Students were able to learn about robotics, experiencing robotics. This was held at Travis and Vogel. We offered two sessions from June 10th to June 14th, and then we had another week from June 17th to June 21st. 73 students participated in this enrichment program. Extended School Year Services, this is a program that's designed for children with disabilities and the purpose is to minimize the loss of acquired critical skills. So we do not want kids to regress over the summer. And um, the ARD committee, the Admission Review Dismissal Committee determines uh, eligibility. So again, this was a full day program. We had two sessions and we uh, served 65 students in this program. You can see the expenditures uh, by far federal sources are the main source of income for this. Title I uh, provided $626,000, Title III $179,000, Title IV $68,000, and then uh, the state reimbursement for LEP was $52,000. We used local monies to supplement the bilingual program. We also use local funds for to supplement the reading and math camp as well as the special education program. And then we also collected $16,888 of tuition. So in all, we served in the elementary world 2,646 students at eight locations. We had 269 teachers, we had 48 paraprofessionals and 11 administrators. So a big summer school for elementary. And so I'll turn it over to Mr. Koshin. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. From a secondary perspective, uh, we served students in, four, in 
three locations and four different programs. Junior high students from Irons, Knox, McCullough, and York Junior High Schools attended summer sessions at McCullough Junior High School. Kevin Solberg, who is with us tonight, served as principal. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Dr. Leonard Brown led the junior high program at Washington Junior High School and served students from Moorhead, Pete, and Washington Junior High Schools. He's unable to be with us tonight. The high school summer school was located at Oak Ridge High School this summer and served all of district high school students. Brad Milam was the administrator for our high school again this year. He did an awesome job. Both of these guys did. Uh, all, Oak Ridge also hosted the extended school year program for high school students. And again, that's a mirror of the elementary intermediate program for those students. And it was led by Lizette Fernandez. I'm not sure if Lizette is here tonight. Um, we're delighted to have these guys with us tonight. They did a great job. We appreciate all their efforts. We offered a variety of programs in an effort to help students reach their academic goals this summer. A variety of opportunities were presented. From a secondary perspective, summer school is very important to help students stay on track or get back on track to graduate on time. High school initial credit opportunities allow both junior high school and high school students the opportunity to take courses required for graduation, allowing room in their schedule during the regular school year for other electives. A lot of students will uh, take uh, advanced placement and honors classes during the regular year, and they'll take uh, required prerequisites uh, during summer school to satisfy those requirements. It allows space and uh, schedules for athletics, fine arts, and other curricular ac extracurricular activities. And it also allows a potential for early graduation if a student would so desire. Uh, high school credit recovery. This is a large portion of summer school and allows students who have struggled during the school year and failed to earn credit in a course uh, to recover that credit during summer school and not have to repeat that the following year. Uh, that up frees <coughs> up class space uh, for us and for our teachers to not have to offer those kids that class one more time. Uh, we also offered online accelerated math credit through Edgenuity for students wanting to get ahead in math. And a lot of our students at the intermediate level will try to accelerate through junior high school courses and junior high kids through early high school courses in an effort to get to the calculus courses at the end of their high school career uh, that they may not have the opportunity to do without these acceleration programs. Uh, we also offer junior high school credit recovery along with the eighth grade star academy for those students who needed another mm -hmm. shot at passing the eighth grade star. And we also offered GED in both English and Spanish in addition to the extended year, uh, extended school year program. Uh, here's a list of some of the initial credit offerings that we offered. As you can see, the basic math classes were uh, accelerated and then we also offered initial credit in uh, a variety of courses through the summer. Uh, credit recovery also encompassed many of those courses as well. Our financial summary is uh, title funds and federal funds paid for $11,724 for the ESL academies. Local sources contributed $75,923 for our special education programs and, and STAR academies. And then tuition-based, uh, our expenses were $330,935 and we collected $324,044 in tuition. And again, I think that's a great investment in uh, allowing kid, uh, students to be on track to graduate on time. In summary, there were 794 students who attended the junior high and high school programs, taking 1,408 courses. As you can see, many students used the summer program to take multiple courses. 176 students took advantage of online accelerated math credit offerings. This was almost 50 students more than the previous summer. 438 total students attended the junior high school summer school program, which again was more than last year. 58 students participated in our extended school year program. 17 students attended GED classes. 83 students participated in the ESL Academy, which was a tremendous increase from the previous year. Of those students, 98% of high school courses taken were completed successfully for credit. 356 initial high school credits were earned by junior and, high, uh, junior and high school and senior high school students. And there were 521 repeat credits that were earned. 
2019 summer school was a great success. Uh, secondary wise, serving over 1,566 students at our three locations, served by 121 teachers, 28 paraprofessionals, three counselors, five nurses, four instructional coaches, and 10 administrators. So in a grand summary, uh, K through 12, we served 4,212 students at 12 locations. It was a great summer. Great job. 98% yeah, success rate, that's awesome. Outstanding job to everyone who contributed to the success of our summer schools. And as you mentioned before, that's the size of some of our, some small school districts. So definitely a feat to be reckoned with. Great job, guys. Um, all right, item five, administration. Receive update regarding our uh, school-based mental health clinics. Uh, Dr. No. Yeah, Ms. Galatis will, pre will present this Thank item for us. Thank you all, President Williams, members of the board. We are really excited tonight. We have Evan Robertson, the Executive Director of Tri-County Behavioral Health Care with us tonight. As you recall, last year we um, started a pilot program with Tri-County um, in, in Armstrong and Granger Lane Intermediate. And uh, Mr. Robertson is going to give us an update on that program and share kind of some exciting news about um, our plans for expansion this school year. Thanks for being here, Evan. Thank you. President Williams, board, Dr. Null, thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, give you a quick update. I've got a couple of uh, bullet points that I want to share, and then I'm open for your questions, and I'll get out of your hair on what I know is a busy night. Um, we were uh, very grateful for the opportunity to be able to work in um, Armstrong Elementary and Grangerland Intermediate this last year. Uh, working in school-based uh, uh, mental health clinics has been a goal of our organization for a while because we know the need is there. And uh, Conroe Independent School District showed the foresight to, to uh, allow us in. Uh, we really had fantastic staff support, uh, including Principal Patricia Thacker at Armstrong and Principal Karen Jones at Grangeland Intermediate. Um, and then also uh, from administration, um, Denise Sapola and Rod Chavez, and of course, uh, Ms. Dr. Null as well. And uh, overall, we impacted over 100 students this last year in those two campuses. Uh, we were able to reduce school uh, visits, especially uh, significant at the Grangerland Independent school, or Intermediate School District. Um, we had a lot of positive feedback from staff, uh, reports of kids utilizing the skills that they had actually learned from our staff in classes. Um, that, that comes off as soft data. It's hard to measure that. But when uh, teachers come back and say, hey, they actually, instead of getting mad, use this skill that you taught, it's a positive thing. Um, so we, we have recognized in that that we're going to have to figure out a better way to measure some of the data that we need. Uh, we um, are uh, looking to expand to two schools, two additional schools in Conroe Independent School District, and they're both in the Kenny Creek Feeder school, uh, System, Ben Milam Elementary that feeds Grangerland Intermediate, and Moorhead Junior High that's fed by Grangerland Intermediate. Uh, we passed 50 kids from uh, Grangerland Intermediate to Moorhead, so we knew the demand was there. And we are also seeing um, lots of need at that K through four level, which is unfortunate, but the case nevertheless. Um, we, we like uh, those locations because we're also able to leverage the Lone Star Family Health Center's uh, clinic that they have on site. Uh, we can do some things cooperatively and hopefully uh, find a way to uh, serve both population needs for physical and mental health. Um, so uh, funding, we're still working on how to make this uh, viable long-term funded uh, project. This was at no cost to CISD. We were able to build some of these services. And, uh, and we have some grant funding for the rest of, of the service array. So um, I'll leave it at that and answer your questions. What does it take to go ahead, uh, Um Just real quick, I, we were very, <clears throat> everybody was very excited about the partnership and, and the work that, uh, that Denise Sapola did and putting all this stuff together. We appreciate it. So the idea seemed like a no brainer to us. And I, I understand what you're saying. My, my question is, how was it received by the parents and, and the students? I understand what you're saying that, you know, we were seeing some results, but you know, sometimes the kids feel like they're being forced to go through this or the parents, did they understand that this was there to be a more of a convenience for them to help out them and, and, the, and the students? I, I would love for you to expand a little bit upon that. The, the parents were very positive about the program and the students, um, we, we found a lot of students that weren't in our role. So these weren't our kids that we were already serving. These were new kids being referred to us by the okay. schools. 
Um, the, the parents had to consent to be a part of this process. Obviously, we're talking about kids mm -hmm. and we're involved in the meetings. One of the things that we did as a part of this a pilot is create a service that doesn't exist in the state's array called pre-intake. But basically what it is, is it's leveling all of the hurdles that people feel like they experience to get into to services are our regular routine clinic. Most of that has to do with paperwork and just ensuring that all the pieces are in place before we can serve a child. So we were able to, to eliminate some of those barriers and help parents actually, who may have otherwise chosen not to take that path. Okay, very good. And one more follow-up question to that is, one of the concerns that I know that we had talked about was about the confidentiality between what you guys were doing and maybe teachers and other students. How, how was that received? How did, how did that work out? We had really great meetings with uh, the administrators who were involved in this program and our staff. And that was one of the things that we did that, frankly, there's no, there's no way to cover that cost, but it's a necessary part of any program like this is lots of communication. That's all done from our perspective under, with consent from the parents. So they have to consent to be a part of this program and they have to consent to share that information. And once they consent to share that information, then we're, we're able to talk openly with certain administrators about the care. And, and, and that's really helpful because mom may not know that Johnny's acting out of math class um, and because she doesn't see that every day. And that communication back and forth really makes the treatment more effective. I know that it's hard to, to measure you know, a lot of times the success, but we also know and understand that, that, that Caney Creek Feeder Zone was in our hearts a lot this last year. They went through quite a few trials. It, it's hard to, to, to put a number on the impact that you could have had you know, with anything any further. So we appreciate your, your love and dedication to those youth and those, those children. We appreciate it. We, uh, we're very eager to serve that. Uh, we're all kids, we sure. our assistants, but certainly there's, there's been some need there that we feel like we can, we can uh, impact. Yeah, I echo that and um, really appreciate the partnership outstanding. Um, just excited about the future of this partnership. So um, that leads me to my next question. As far as viability, the funding going forward, I know it's a bit premature, but have we given some thought to potentially <clears throat> what that would cost the district or whomever it may be that picks up the tab for that? So our loss last year was $53,000 per campus. Okay. Um, but we, I say loss, but we had, we utilized some grant funding that we had for therapy, expanded therapy. And because we were expanding therapy on these sites, we were able to cover those costs. Um, we are uh, spoken with uh, Houston Methodist Foundation last year and are speaking to them again this year. Um, we're also looking at other grant opportunities um, for funding. Uh, this is something that folks are interested in learning more about. Uh, part of our design has also been to try to figure out how to make it as cost effective as possible within the school. So right now we're spending a lot of time in, in meetings with each other, talking to each other. Is that always going to be necessary? Probably not. But initially, you, you can't, almost can't over communicate, not so much about the kids' needs, but about the process issues. So I referred this kid what happened and where did the, the, the ball drop. So ultimately, we're hoping that that $53,000 loss is actually not representative of, of future years. Um, after Conrad Independent School District uh, elected to, to do this, uh, we were in the papers uh, a few times, and uh, every school district is calling us now, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> wanting us in their schools, and we're trying to work out solutions for them. I have a limited pot of, of funding to, to kind of figure this out. And what I'm telling them is I'm trying to design a pilot that's the most cost effective. It's what we try to do is to, to make this the most cost effective while impacting the kids we serve. So. Um, hopefully this next year we'll see that number drop. I will tell you that a part of that number is just people without any form of insurance, any way to bill for any of the services we provide. So there's a percentage of that that you find in each school it makes it a little bit challenging. Understand. So viability, long-term sustainability, um, we're still working through those issues. And uh, I have a meeting, I think next week actually with uh, Methodist Foundation again to talk to them about it. They were interested, but not ready to write me a check. Sometimes it takes a couple of years to write a check. Outstanding job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank on. you. I just have a comment more than a question on this. Um, this to, to me, this is so important to what we're doing because it, it affects so many different levels in our schools. Um, and we're providing needed services to our students, and that's what the school district is about. But we're helping teachers. You said it, it's hard to quantify, but you have anecdotal evidence that we're helping teachers on the front end with classroom management. Um, 
I consider this to be a part of our integrated safety and security program by providing early intervention with at-risk students and then just expanding the counseling capabilities and the capacities, um, both of, of your organization and of these campuses that are being served. Um, so, so I commend you and I commend Denise's department and everybody that's been involved in this. Um, there's so many different levels that this touches our school district and provides positive impact all the way across. So thank you for what sh your staff has done for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, item 5B, receive capital improvement updates. All right, Mr. Foster. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It's my pleasure to bring forward an update of our capital improvements we've got underway throughout the district. We'll start with a little bit of success at such a, such my elementary. We were able to welcome new students to that campus for its first day uh, last week for the first day of school. You can see from the picture overhead, uh, the building finished up nicely. The roads are open around it. Uh, so the county's still working to get us a uh, road connection to 242, but everything around our building is open and circulating just like we had hoped for for the first day of school. Uh, as you can see, it turned out to be a very beautiful building and we're uh, working well to blend in with the neighborhood around us. Uh, on the inside, uh, it's like in kind with what we've been producing over the past several years. And the students are using that building to its fullest capabilities as uh, every day, I mean, from this day forward. So moving to Austin Elementary as uh, another little bit of a success where we removed some of the older portions of that building from service. So you can see from this old red picture, and this was a difficult project to start with because we couldn't tear down those old portions of the building until school got out uh, at the end of May. Uh, so for this, for the first day of school, you're looking at a picture that's a week old. So the good news is as we move forward, you'll start seeing grass in these pictures. So for the first day of school, the kids were able to see and the, and the parents and, and the People that drove up to school for the first day got to see something look more finished, uh, which is what we'd hope to produce uh, by the end of the summer. Right. And on the inside of that building, I mean, the finishes, everything else has come together. The classrooms have come together, and the kids are using that uh, building uh, more and more each day. Uh, as our contractors are still are working on the finer details, as we expected them to be, but they are wrapping them up uh, in the evenings and weekends, and we'll be out of there very shortly. Then moving on to Stockton Junior High School. Stockton is scheduled to open in August of 2020, so it's August of next year. So the building is, is where we would expect to be at this point. So the major scopes of work, as you can see from the overhead picture, are to, to dry in that building. So to get the exterior walls in, uh, get the masonry uh, underway, you can see masonry poking up uh, all around that building now. Uh, you can see looking deep into the picture, the athletic fields are under construction. You can see the track very clearly in the background. Just uh, in the foreground of the track is our po uh, part of our photovoltaic field where we should be producing power and reaping the benefit from that uh, towards the end of September. Uh, so we'll finish uh, most of the last year of construction with solar power as one of our uh, one of our uh, on-site renewable resources. Now, again, that picture is about a week old, so you can see now the the athletic turf is in. So this is the natural uh, natural grass turf for the uh, for the football field. So we needed a full year of growing, uh, so it's established. So when football practice starts, it just doesn't uh, uh, wear out uh, immediately. So that that is what you're looking at there. And on the exterior of the building, you see the masonry, the brick veneer is starting to come around. The exterior block walls are being constructed on the outside. So the masonry contractor is working in earnest to move around that building as quickly as possible. And then on the inside is where the, the real critical path is uh, for building all the interior walls that build our corridors and our classrooms and all the other things that make the building tick on the inside. So you're looking down one of the back uh, corridors for the fine arts and athletics wing, which is the tallest part of the building where they start all the masonry work. Those walls go up about 22 feet to the bottom of the deck, so it takes a lot of effort to get them built. And then they work their way towards the academic portions of the building where the walls are shorter and the deck heights are smaller. And that's where they're headed now. Now at Connor High School, where we did building addition that opened last uh, winter break, uh, and we've been working on the second floor renovation. So you're seeing some of the, the, uh, the interior finishes from the building addition that was done. We're bringing into the oldest portion of that building. Uh, so the second floor renovations, uh, the finishes mimic or, or basically are like in kind with what is in the newest portion of the building. So we're bringing the uh, new uh, standard of construction into the oldest portions of that building now. So the second floor did open for school on the first day of school last week. And then now we're moving from those classrooms, which are in use, to the ground floor on the first floor of that main building for those oldest portions. So you can see last month you saw pictures, Mr. Phillips showed you the uh, pictures of demolition near, nearing completion. 
And now you're seeing those walls and those uh, uh, classrooms starting to come back together on the inside of that first floor. Now we will be on that first floor through the end of December, uh, which that is exactly how that project was scheduled and it'll wrap up and open uh, when the children return from the winter break uh, next January. And that is our update. Awesome. Thank you. Outstanding job. Thank you, sir. Nice job Gentlemen. getting all that done. So uh, that's well, a lot of construction. It is, and, and it's not just and, us. And it rained a lot. Well, I can tell you that our purchasing department, our maintenance department, our finance department, everybody did come together to help help overcome that rain. So we did we did suffer a lot, but we were able to pull together in the end. So thank you. Where did all that rain go? Great job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Since in the river. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Item six, business and finance, consider award of RFPQ 1904-04, property boiler and machinery, machinery crime and active shooter, malicious acts, insurance, Dr. No. All right, once again, we'll invite Mr. Rick Reeves, our director of purchasing up to present this item. <coughs> Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. No. Tonight we are recommending the board award RFP number 190404, property boiler and machinery, crime and active shooter, malicious acts insurance, to Souls Insurance for a total annual premium of $1,721,302. Requests for proposals pertaining to these insurance categories were emailed to registered vendors to the electronic CISD bidding system and was advertised two times in the Conrad Courier. Three proposals were submitted, including one no bid. The insurance policy shall be effective September 1st, 2019 to September 1st, 2020, with the option to renew annually for two additional one-year terms through September 1st, 2022, for a total of three years. Mr. Joe Blasey with McGriff, Seibels & Williams, the district's insurance and risk management consultant, conducted the analysis of the insurance proposals and is here this evening to answer any questions. The analysis was evaluated by the finance department and reviewed by the purchasing department. At this time, I recommend your approval. Thank you. Gentlemen, got a motion. Uh, move approval of RFP 1904-04 as presented. Second. I second the motion. Got a motion, second discussion. I have a couple of questions. Mr. Sander. I, I didn't have an opportunity to compare last year's policy to this year's policy. Can you tell me if there were any major changes as far as deductibles, other kinds of kind of risk management uh, implications that were made that can affect our premium? Absolutely. Happy to. Members of the board, uh, thank you for having us this evening. Uh, in an effort to mitigate um, cost increase, uh, the decision was made to lower the loss limit, the per occurrence loss limit, from $750 million to $500 million okay. per occurrence. Uh, additionally, the carrier uh, has increased the flood deductible on one particular campus, North Prince, Gladys Elementary. <laughs> Uh, there, are, there are 11 uh, campuses that are now considered to be in a high hazard flood zone and therefore the, the limit, the flood limit for those uh, locations has, has decreased to 10 million and we've had to buy a national flood insurance policy on one of the campuses. So I saw that NFIP policy in there as well. That's right. But that max is like half a million, right? That's right. What it does is it basically erodes the deductible that the property uh, carrier will impose okay. on that building. Okay. Mm. So that, it, that now makes sense. Okay. That's right. So I didn't understand why we bought the one. That's right. And okay. it's possible that when we come back next year, we'll have to buy additional NFIP policies on these other 11 buildings that FEMA has now designated as high hazard. I know they keep changing location. the maps, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Reed. Okay. Um, did we, you said we had three bids that submitted. One was no bid and then we had two others. Why did we chose one over the other? Uh, well, they offered the best value. So TASB was a no bid and they thought that they couldn't service what we were looking for. So we want to keep our service on units. Okay. It's a very limited market right now in the post Harvey and other catastrophe uh, environment. Uh, hopefully we're, we're, we'll see an increase in competition and carrier interest in future years but right now it's a very difficult market for texas schools all right tell me a motion second all in favor <clears throat> any other, oh any further discussion all right motion Call second for. all in favor abstention motion passes thank you gentlemen appreciate it
All right, item uh, 6B, I'm sorry, 6, yeah, 6B, consider approval of 2019-2020 official school budget. All Dr. Right. No. Mr. Rice. <clears throat> Yes, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to recommend the Board of Trustees approve the 2019-2020 official school budget as presented and discussed in the public hearing and as recommended by the District Level Planning and Decision Making Committee. At this time, I recommend your approval of the 2019-2020 official school budget. I move we approve as presented. I second, second the motion. Can we have a motion? Motion, second, and a third. Any discussion? I have some discussion. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Emmon. Mr. Rice, yes. I think, well, you, you know, we had some discussions, and I understand about a half a penny, correct me if I'm wrong, you said it would be about $2 million? Yes, $1.8 million. In budget? Mm -hmm. I, I've heard people, and we all have tonight as well as in the last several weeks, and I've talked to some of our state reps, that when I see our tax bills and I talk to people that says our tax bills went up, and I know we can blame Austin, but there needs to be some level that we say your bill will be at the same or lower than last year. We just had all this compression and everyone I talked to, they said my tax bill went up and it's CISD. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna discuss the tax rate, tax rate on the next the item. Next item. No, this is, the this is just the budget. budget. We have to adopt budget. the budget first and then the tax I rate. thought that's what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> budget first, then tax rate. Budget. Hicks nay on the discussion. <laughs> If you have a question on the budget, this is the time to ask. Yeah. Good question, budget. Well, if we're talking about the budget as far as adopting, yes. Are we about to adopt that the one, two, three, five? No, no this, this is the budget. budget. This, this is the budget. The this tax is budget. The tax this rate. is the okay. annual tax operating. Rate separate separate so we're, we're taking the five fifty-five. We talk on the budget. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, but if we if we accept that that budget amount, well, we're kind of stuck then on the rate, aren't we? No. No, no. it's nothing to do with the rate. No. Okay. <laughs> Finish discussion. <laughs> All right, motion. Um, we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Motion passes. All right, here we are. Item uh, 6C consider adopting set by order resolution the 2019 ad valorem tax rate to support the 2019 2020 budget, maintenance and operations tax rate, and debt service tax rate. Mr. Rice, Dr. Nolan, Mr. Rice. Yes. Thank you, President Williams. As we have presented and discussed in the public hearing, the tax rates to fund the maintenance and operation and debt service budgets for the 2019-2020 fiscal year have primarily been set by the state. The district has been working to find a local solution to help provide taxpayers with additional property tax relief. Given that House Bill 3 no longer, no longer allows us to transfer surplus funds generated by the MO tax rate to the debt service fund, we're requesting that the board authorize the use of $1,749,657 of the debt service fund fund balance to supplement the debt service fund tax rate. This will allow us to reduce the previously proposed debt service tax rate from 26 and a half cents to 26 cents. We are traditionally very conservative with our estimates, especially when it comes to our debt service requirements. And we have been working uh, with our financial advisor and this plan is more aggressive, but it is not irresponsible. So first, I would like to thank the whole board and especially Mr. Skeeter Hubert for, for your uh, direct assistance in this task. So my recommendation is tonight, I'm recommending that the Board of Trustees approve the order to adopt a 2019 tax rate of 97 cents for maintenance and operations and 26 cents for debt service per $100 of valuation to fund the 2019-2020 official school budget. The total combined tax rate of $1.23 per 100 is five cents slower than last year's and is below our effective tax rate of $1.2344. At this time, I recommend your approval. We have a motion, General. Mr. President, I move to adopt and set by order resolution the 2019 ad valorem tax rate for maintenance and operation of 97 cents per $100 and the 2019 ad valorem tax rate for debt services of 26 cents per $100. Second the motion. Second. We got a motion and a second. <laughs> Any discussion? All right. 
just a just a little bit of discussion. Um, hats off to, to Mr. Rice and and uh, Dr. Noel, and also anybody and everybody else who was involved. In We've been through this several times and we understand that the state of Texas is doing their very best to offer relief to, to residents of, of the great state of Texas. And, and in doing so, we are able to achieve a lower tax rate. But in everything that they were able to do, um, it was this school board, everybody here, and this administration that was able to get this tax rate below the effective rate. That was what was really important to all of us, was to make sure that the state of Texas made these uh, bold promises that taxes were going to go down. And, and what they meant was tax rates were going down, but because of property values, it doesn't necessarily mean that your tax bill was going down, as Mr. Inman alluded to. In doing this, we were able to meet all of our obligations and also provide Conroe Independent School District um, taxpayers that actual tax bill relief that was promised. So hats off to you and hats off to this board for working so diligently to make sure that happened. Thank you very much. Well said. Thank you. Gentlemen. I think the other thing is when you really, as Mr. Rice presented early, early on talking in the budget hearing, our school district is very transparent in our finances. And since I've been on the board, you can go out and look at the checkbook. You can go out and see anything you need to find out about our school district is available to all of the public at any given time. And that transparency means a lot to me as a taxpayer. It certainly makes me proud as a board member to be a part of a district that is as transparent. And the fact that we've been good stewards of the taxpayers' money really has led us to be able to take this bold step and do this given the way funding has always been. It's 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 I wish the funding were the same between every school district in the state of Texas, and it's just not so. And um, it's that's why that's why it's hard and it's difficult. And that's why it does take time to go through and put the budget together. And then you get board members that come back and say, we don't like that number of change it again. And and you do three or four different scenarios. And it's a lot of work. And I commend you, Mr. Rice, and Dr. Null and the rest of the finance department and all those that had a part in this budget. It really is historical tonight that we're able to do such a thing. And I think this is the third time now that we've been able to lower the tax rate since I've been on the board. And I'm proud to be a part of that and I'm proud of this board for what they're doing. And I do have one question, Mr. Moore. You can applaud for me if you want to, I'll wait. <laughs> Good job. Mr. Rice. Um, yes, this board approved a bond election last week. Can you uh, enlighten us as to potential impacts on, on that that bond might have on, on the tax now, rate? This tax rate that we're setting tonight, let's just be clear, it, it does not include any future bond. Right. However, in our forecasting models, the bond referendum that y'all proposed to the voters, our, our models show that we will not have to increase the debt service tax rate any longer. Thank you. Outstanding. Thanks for that clarification. All right, gentlemen, motion second. Discussion. Um, all in favor? Motion passes. All right. Very good. Man, that was a nice one. I like that. That was good. All right, let's go. Um, item 6D, receive financial reports. Seems like that's all we've been doing all night. <laughs> you got one some more time. numbers? One more time, Mr. Rice. Right. One more number. There you one go. More. I need another bottle of water. Yeah, I, I need another bottle of water. I do for a living, but I'm, I'm seeing enough numbers tonight. Let's go for it. Yes, uh, thank you, President Williams. I'm here to present the financial statements this evening for the month of July. Uh, these statements will include our general fund, debt service, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. The first statement we'll look at this evening is our balance sheet for the month. Our balance sheet includes our assets, our liabilities, and our fund balances. Uh, each month, we like to take a look at our cash and investments. And once again, we'll concentrate here on the general fund. We have cash on hand of $14,100. Uh, we have bank deposits of $1,329,000. We have investments in the state investments pool of $32 million. We have investments with Wood Forest National Bank, $120.2 million. Our longer term investments, TCG Investment Advisors. $51.2 million for total cash and investments in the general fund of $204.8 million. 
The next statement we'll look at this evening is our income statement. Our income statement includes our revenues and expenditures for the district. Our revenues are broken down into three categories that include local and intermediate sources, state program revenues, and federal program revenues. Uh, just taking a look at the detail of our local and intermediate sources. As you can see, property taxes is the largest generator of revenues for our general fund and debt service fund. It's food sales and child nutrition, and it's premium contributions in our self-funded insurance plan. We can also look at our year-to-date expenditures uh, for each of the funds. And you can see the largest expenditure in our general fund is our payroll. This is our 2015 bond referendum status update. And uh, as Mr. Foster presented earlier, we're almost through the whole, the whole program. We just have, uh, stock and junior high left out there. We still have a, a small amount of uh, technology left to purchase, but overall we have an estimate to complete of our total bond program of $17,467,000. And that'll leave us with the remaining contingency of about $9.5 million. Update on our self-funded insurance. We knew July would be a tough month and August is gonna be a tough tough month also. But overall, our total revenues in our self-funded insurance of $45.5 million. On the expense side, $44.3 million. Currently, our revenues are over our expenditures by $1.2 million. And uh, participation in our wellness centers, our employees are, are enjoying that and uh, visiting our wellness center, but averaging about 525 a month. What was our number last year? And would you know August number ballpark? That's okay. You can get it. Uh, you're talking about the, the overall expense? No, just for the month. Yeah, for, 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 the, for the month of August? Yeah, I, I, I do not remember what's top of my head. We, we, we still had more revenue than expense. I remember that, but I don't yeah. know what the number was. Okay. So it looks like we're still been in flag by yes. far. Yep. I'm, I'm a, just so you know, you know, I'm, I'm tracking it every day. I see it just <laughs> every check that. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm watching that every day because it's, you know, that, you know, the health insurance plan is one of the things that I hold dear and dear to my heart. Agree. And, and, and I, and I'm watching that every day. It's going to be close. Okay. We're, you know, we're over $3 million already on the 20th of August. So we still have another couple of weeks to go. Some of those claims um, don't hit till October. So, so it's going to be close. I'm we just we do have it. cushion of $1.2 million, yeah, I'm looking but, but I think, I think we're going to be okay, but it's going to be close. Okay. So part value of our total investments is $346.5 million. Um, investments in our pools are, yearn, are, are yielding 2.446%. Our investment with Wood Forest National Bank, 2.37%. And our longer term investments that are managed with TCG Investment Advisors, 2.214%. And I think as we see, as, as they start rolling back interest rates, you're gonna see that our plan of three years on that chart, TCG is going to be on the other side Absolutely. of this before oh, too long. Right. So our combined portfolio has a WAM of 59 days, yeah, yielding 2.377. Market turn. Our benchmark, which is the 90-day T-bill, is right about 2%. Good job. Spread's getting better than it was last year. Yes, sir. I know the market turning. Yes, sir. Yeah. Wait a minute. So the, one, one other question, if you go back one slide, I'm sorry. I'm watching the money. <laughs> we appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. So the pools, how often does that yield change? I know it's normally, it, I know it changes. Daily. It change daily. Yes. But they're not buying anything longer than 90 days. Is that right? At the most, yes. Sir. Okay, that's what yeah. I thought. A lot okay. of theirs is overnight money. Cause, so cause, cause so it pull. may be relatively high right now and begin to dip down over the next several months as the market has softened somewhat yes, sir. rate. Environment. Okay. Yes, sir. And correct. then and that's what you're talking about with TCG because it's a longer term investment. Rates are going to actually move up for that one. Correct. All right. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. It's the money market. It's the money market. I'm curious about that. All right. Um, all right. Item 9A, executive session. Dr. Uh, no. Thank you. This meeting of the Conroe ISD Board of Trustees is convened on August 20th, 2019. The quorum of the board is present, including the following members, Mr. Moore, Mr. Husbands, Mr. Kidd, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hubert, Mr. Sanders, and Mr. Inman. The board will hear the complaint appeal of parents, Ms. LJ and Mr. DR in accordance with local board policy FNG. This hearing is being recorded. 
Ms. LJ and Mr. DR's complaint is against a staff member in the district's transportation department. Because their complaint is against a district employee and because personally identifiable information about a public school student could be revealed, the hearing will be held in closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.074 and 551.0821. The board will also go into executive session under Texas Government Code Section 551.071 for consultation with the board's attorney. The meeting is now adjourned to executive session under Texas Government Code Section 551.071, 551.074, and 551.0821. Everyone not associated with the hearing should leave the room. The board will take no action while in the executive session. The time is now 739. All right, Jamie. The board has reconvened in open session. The time is now 8.49. The board will now make its decision. The board can uphold the decisions of the level one and level two hearing officers. The board can overturn the hearing officer's decision or the board can grant any relief they feel is appropriate. Is there a motion at this time? Yes, there is. I move that the board uphold the level two decision as we did not see a push. However, we are very concerned about the appearance of the behavior of Ms. Kramer when considering the totality of the circumstances. And we desire to have further conversations with the superintendent regarding this employee as her actions are not in keeping with the culture of CISD. I second. second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? No, sir. All those in favor? That's a unanimous decision. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Remigio, the district will send you written notice confirming the action taken by the board. Okay. And this will conclude our hearing. Open session? Yes, we are in open session. All right, motion, second. 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 All in favor?